Well, hello again, dear friends. Feeling inspired, recording second video in the same series of CRCST exam preparation. And let's move forward with more questions, answers, and explanations. As again, as always, I suggest that you transcribe the video by hand. Record the questions, write down the questions, write down the answers and the rationale. Have it then transcribed into the computer, thereby giving you an opportunity to internalize and memorize, memorialize these questions and answers and the logic behind them. That way, when you get to uh, sit for the exam, you will be in good shape. OK, listening to these uh, again and again and again is highly recommended. Uh, total immersion into sterile processing is the way to go to prepare for the exam. You should live and breathe sterile processing and exam preparation. That is your um, true success and in, in, in incorporating into this all of your senses, listening, reading, writing, typing, all of the things that you can put in there. And of course, practical application of the gain knowledge together with constant repetition by practical application. I mean, teach this information to whoever will listen or will not listen. You will succeed. Uh, let's go with the question. Question number one. Chelating or sequestering agents help do all of the following except some people pronounce the word chelation or chelating as chelating, whatever. Um, you know what I mean? So chelating or sequestering agents help do all of the following except. Keyword number one, minimize formulation of insoluble deposits. Number two, prevents instruments from spotting. Number three, measures alkalinity. Number four, prevents equipment scaling. You should remember what chelating or chelating agents are. They sequester, meaning they close up dirt particles so they can't reattach. So out of all of these, only one stands out as a true answer, which is one of the things except they do all of the above except measure alkalinity. Well, alkalinity has nothing to do with this, so it's guaranteed the right answer. OK, so. That's the way it is. Let's move on to the next question. OK, next question will be the following. The method for testing different types of detergents to find out if one performs better or more effectively than the other is. Listen to the question one more time. The method for testing different types of detergents to find out if one performs better or more effectively than the other is number one. Trial testing, number two, valuation testing, number three, validation testing, and four, control testing. So it is valuable to test different types of detergents to find out if one works better or more effectively than the other. Collecting data and assessing their results would be using validation. To validate simply means to corroborate what the manufacturer had said. So manufacturer says it does this. They provide their stuff. Your job is to validate. And that's what the answer is here. Hopefully the answer makes sense. Next question. Bed pans, blood pressure cuffs and bed rails are examples of which Spalding classification? Bed pans, blood pressure cuffs, and bed rails are examples of which Spalding classification? Critical, non critical, semi critical, and rarely critical. Wow, well, I've never heard of rarely critical, so we're going to bounce that right out of there. Now, so Spalding system, if you remember, is a system of classification and recalls of instruments. You have surgical instruments that come in contact with flowing blood, easy to spread infection. OK, you have stuff that comes in contact with mucous membranes and, you know, he also can get sick. Uh, and the other one is you have um, something that comes in contact with intact skin. Well, all of these things that we're talking about here, bed pans, blood pressure cuffs and bed rails are examples of non-critical devices. They're not critical. 
they come in contact with intact skin. So the answer here is non-critical. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, some products are more effective if hot, uh, in hot water because molecules move more quickly. Temperatures for hot water range from, oh, just remember folks, when you're working with the book, every time you see temperatures, temperature ranges, any numbers, uh, these are the things that you have to commit to memory, both in Celsius, and in Fahrenheit. So you need to be proficient in both. Lucky for us, it's not that many. So let's read the question one more time. Some products are more effective in hot water because molecules more move more quickly. Temperatures for hot water range from 98.7 to 165 degrees. Well, we know that's not exactly true because 98.7 is not hot. That's the body temperature. So that's warm. Uh, the next uh, one would be 120 Fahrenheit to 165. And remember, 212 is boiling. OK, so, uh, you know, we're now we're in the in the zone 120 and 165. That's pretty hot. 165 to 185. You know, you can boil tea with that one. So if you can boil tea or coffee in this water, you know. Chances are enzymes are going to die in there and 165 to 212. That's definitely the wrong answer. Um, 212 is definitely too high. They remember they're looking for a valid range. 120 to 165 would be the correct answer. So in this particular case, second answer is correct. Write that down and commit that to memory. Next question. Which of the following packaging materials is unsuitable for packaging items to be sterilized in gas plasma? Reminder. Gas plasma gets absorbed by cellulose, which is number one ingredient in paper, linen, and cotton. Okay, so let's read the question one more time. Which of the following packaging material is unsuitable for packaging items to be sterilized in gas plasma? Number one is nylon. No. Number two, aluminum foil. No. Oh, number three, textile products, and number four, plastic films. Well, since I already let the cat out of the bag, number three, textile products, which include cotton and linen, which all contain cellulose, which absorbs hydrogen peroxide or gas plasma. This is your right answer. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's move on. Modern woven textiles are suitable for use in sterilization packaging for all, but which of the following reasons? Modern woven textiles are suitable for use in sterilization packaging for all but which of the following reasons. Number one, they have a tighter weave. Number, number two, they're not reusable. Number three, they may be chemically treated. Number four, they may consist of multiple layers. So the combination of multiple layers, um, tighter weave and chemical treatment has made modern woven textiles suitable for use in sterilization packaging. Woven textiles are reusable, of course, and require laundering inspection with a, a lightened, with a lighted table, uh, delinting and, and, uh, and the following between uses. So the correct answer would be number two, they're not reusable. OK, uh, I think the question here is somewhat incorrect, The uh, it's. Uh, no, it's all right. The question's OK, let's uh, let's move forward to the next uh, to the next question here. OK, a chemical indicator is placed inside each pouch. Or uh, package in which position? So chemical indicator is placed inside each pouch package in which position? Is it number one on top? Is it number two on the bottom? Is it near a label or is it next to the packaged instruments? So number one, top, number two, bottom, number three, uh, near the label, number four, near to the packaged instruments. So before we come up with the answer, let's think about the rationale. Where, what's the purpose of the chemical indicator? Well, the purpose of the chemical indicator is to show that the package or the item inside has been exposed to the rigors of the sterilization process. 
So do we care about whether it's on top or on the bottom? Well, we really don't. So we can chuck that off to the side. Near a label? No. But near to the instrument. It's the sterilization or the exposure of the actual instrument that needs to be verified. So if we put it next to the instrument is where it counts. And of course, this is the right answer. OK, so number four here next to the packaged instrument is where we need to be. Hopefully that made sense. Hopefully that made sense. OK. Next question, a minimum space of what size should be left between the item and the seals of a pouch? And we have a few answers here. Quarter inch, half inch, three quarters of an inch or one inch. And let me remind you what the question is again. A minimum space of what size should be left between the item and the seals of a pouch? Well, the answer is one inch and the rationale is when using a pouch, care should be taken to choose the correct size. It is important to leave a minimum of one inch of space between the item and the seals of a pouch. Okay, this, this is straight from the book. So just remember, the instrument can't be too close to the edges, so it doesn't. It needs to be open. The uh, the the sharp edges needs to be need to be protected, and of course, you know, between the seals. So uh, the instrument either doesn't have too much play space, one inch is kind of where they draw the line, and it doesn't push on the outer seams, so it's not to puncture or to rip apart the package. So one inch from the seams. Hopefully that the explanation made sense. Okay. Next question. When the package wrappers are also being used to create a sterile field, they must be large enough to extend how far below the edge on all four sides of the table. So let's run the question one more time. When the package wrappers are also being used to create a sterile field, they must be large enough to extend how far below the edge on all four sides of the table. Well, so you rip open a package and the packaging material flops over past the edge of the table. The question is how much? Is it 12 inches? Is it two inches? Is it 18 inches or is it six inches? So answer one, 12 inches. Answer two, two inches. Answer three, 18 inches. And a, uh, answer four, six inches. There is no rhyme or reason here. It's just a certain rule. And the rule is six inches below. So the correct answer here is number four. Uh, this is what it is. Let's go to the next question and we'll stop here for the session. This is uh, good enough. I, I try to keep it short to keep your, so you can finish this all at once. So question, next question, next question, next question. Question: Which of the following statements about basin sets is least accurate? Ooh, I love these questions. Make sure to pay close attention to the language. Language is key. Don't just breeze through it. Read it a couple of times. Which of the following statements about basin sets is least accurate? And you got to pay attention to the, you know, the logical thread here. Basins, number one, basin sets should be prepared so that basins are oriented to alternately face different directions. Two, if nested, basins should be at least one difference in size. Oh. Next, the weight of wrap basin sets should not exceed seven pounds. Oh. And if nested, the basins should be prepared with non-linting absorbent material. So basin sets should be prepared so that basins are oriented to alternately face different directions. OK. The total number of basin sets per load should be evaluated to help ensure dry sets. What you don't want is stuff from leaking one on top of the other, and that's the rationale for this question. So the answer here is number one, basin sets should be prepared so that basins are oriented to alternately face different directions. I'll stop right here. Once again, 
I want to ask you to make sure to like and to share these videos. Please comment. It is very important for me to hear your feedback, so I go on making these videos. All right. Have a wonderful rest of the day, and I will see you soon.